In response to your question as best I can, though, you know, the interview process is a bit like a funnel generally, and you would always expect that that first interview, I guess, is, I mean, organisations do it two different ways. It can be a slightly more casual kind of interview to get an initial sense of the alignment of personality trait and of values and a bit of a general overview of somebody's background. Hi, and welcome to the Career Success Coach podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Macris, and I'm really excited today to have Susie McInerney, who is the CEO of Six Degrees Executive. Welcome, Susie. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited about our conversation today because so often um, we, I speak to executives who you know, have so many questions about the process and how to sort of get the edge, I suppose, over the competition and how to work with recruiters in the best way. I'd love to touch on, you know, some of that today and also sort of see what's in store for the year 2023. Absolutely. So first of all, can you just tell us a little bit about your career? Uh, Sure, I can. I'll start with the present. And as you mentioned, I'm currently the CEO of Six Degrees. We're a national recruitment and executive search firm, and we have 100 people across offices in Eastern Seaboard and obviously helping great talent find great jobs in a number of different industries and across quite a diverse range of disciplines. Uh, The business has been around nearly 20 years. It's a privately owned Australian firm. I've been with the organisation for 12 and coming into my fourth year as the CEO. So uh, quite an incredible journey with this organisation. And then prior to that, uh, I had eight years straight out of uni. I studied a a double degree in arts marketing and set about a career in toys and entertainment marketing, which was a fun way to start what I thought would be a very lineal career in corporate brand marketing. Uh, I had a great trajectory with that business uh, that um, started out as a small privately owned firm and over the eight years that that I was there um, became quite a large publicly listed firm uh, and it was an awesome trajectory for me as a first job. I then threw caution to the wind because I could uh, and took up a passion project uh, owning and operating a restaurant with some uh, with some others, uh, which was a an interesting life experience. So that is I've different. Typically, yeah, I've typically described my career as having taken the scenic route, <laughs> like hospitality, that. marketing, and now recruitment. But actually, it's quite common these days for people to have a number of different uh, career experiences. For me, I can see the strong connection looking back between those three things, hospitality, marketing and recruitment. Um, so it perhaps it wasn't by design, but it actually makes quite a lot of sense considering my passion and what I believe my strengths are. Was it hard to transition industries? From, I uh, suppose- I'd love to see- Yeah. I mean, I'd love to say um, uh, that it was and that I took a long time thinking about how I was going to do this, but actually it was a series of quite fateful kind of moments in my life that led me to these opportunities rather than it being a really intentional strategy. So I feel like lots of happy accidents along the way that turned out to be incredible career moves. Oh, that's great. So I often read your great posts on LinkedIn and uh, hence why I asked you to be a guest on our podcast today. You know, obviously, is that something that you focus on, like building your profile within the market? Uh, well, it certainly, yeah, I mean, it certainly is now. Um, and, you know, practicing what I preach to, you know, to our candidates and to clients and so forth in terms of the importance of having a meaningful presence on LinkedIn. In recruitment, it does make sense for us to be really alive on a platform that's so important to our success. But for me personally, uh, it's about, I guess, establishing a profile that hopefully will attract clients to our business, but also attract people to come and work for the organisation that I lead. And it's really important, I think, to become somewhat of a talent magnet as you progress as a leader. And one of the ways that you can do that is certainly to um, hopefully build your network on platforms like LinkedIn and have an authentic presence. I think that people feel like they can get to understand the kind of person and leader that you are. 
I love that because a lot of people, I suppose, don't think about the benefit of the talent side. Like you're actually attracting people to work with you as well when you build your brand. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm sure we'll come to talk about this concept of a hidden job market, but, and it works both ways. Uh, LinkedIn is obviously a powerful platform for us to be able to tap people on the shoulder who may not be looking for jobs, which is primarily where we, you know, are asked to find talent from that passive talent market. Um, but yeah, as a leader of a business that is always looking to grow through attracting great talent sometimes not from our industry, it is absolutely important in my example, but I think also is now important um, across many industries and for most leaders that I can think of. Mm, that's great. So 2023, yeah. it's upon us. <laughs> There's no escaping. <laughs> We're here. Um, so what are employees looking for from an executive candidate this year and moving forward? Yeah, it's a really good question. And we clearly have the privilege, I guess, of collecting lots of insights through the, you know, let's call it thousands of job briefs that we take from clients at varying levels every year. So we have this very live kind of data opportunity to kind of see, well, what is in, what really lies beneath the surface in terms of those briefs? And when, a, when someone's expressing kind of this is the ideal candidate, uh, what are some of the things that they're seeking? I would say that in summary, given how much change has occurred, let's call it through and post pandemic, how much uncertainty there still is in relation to uh, where we'll all land as far as this new world of work, uh, the ongoing requirement for digital transformation uh, and just general now, you know, kind of concern about where the economy may be heading. One of the key things that I think has emerged as a, a really key skill for executives is this concept of adaptability and change agility. So, of course, all the same things are true about leaders and executives needing to have, you know, kind of an authentic uh, and genuine, you know, kind of way in terms of how they lead, as opposed to this concept of command and control mm. that used to be yes. uh, what, how people led, um, that now just absolutely, you know, doesn't cut it. But adaptability, being able to, to understand um, how to lead through transformation where there's lots of uncertainty present, but also how to lead in an environment where I think we're all trying to understand how this hybrid virtual work um, ways of working will land. So I think adaptability and change agility are two emerging capabilities that executives need to be able to, you know, show evidence of. I think that's really key. Adaptability um, and cape and what was the other one? Sorry. Change and change agility. Change agility. Yeah, so yeah, they're somewhat linked, obviously, but, but, um, I mean, change is just a constant in this environment. So how leaders are able to lead people through that effectively while still driving really strong value to an organization is, is quite a challenge. So is that something that, um, in the interview process or on your resume, you should be actually sort of highlighting these sort of change projects that you might have been involved in or massive transformation yeah, I mean, programs? Absolutely. Um, it used to be the case that we used to be able to talk about our technical skills that we've gathered along the way. And now really the art and science of being able to um, to land a great job and to impress upon a client why you are an amazing candidate comes down to how you can articulate your um, behavioural capabilities and the role that you have played in driving change or transformation, how you went about that and the evidence that your leadership was successful through that period in driving an outcome and retaining talent is quite an art and it does need to be evidence-based. Right. And the best way, though, to bring that to life is in really compelling storytelling. Mm. Oh, that's fascinating. It is so different now, isn't it? It's much more... Absolutely. We spend a lot of time thinking about how much leadership has changed and what does the future of leadership look like. And yeah, I mean, trust and empathy and vulnerability, all, you know, absolutely important pre-pandemic became exceptionally important during um, the pandemic. And now are almost hygiene factors for what good leadership looks like. Now we're kind of shifting to, yeah, these new leadership strengths, um, in, as I said, in kind of adaptability and change agility and resilience, I think, is a really important one too. Um, people want to see that their leaders are vulnerable yes. <laughs> and are also struggling in some cases to deal with the change. Are you so, so vulnerable, but also very confident in terms of, um, you know, that almost comfort with discomfort is, is something else that we think is 
uh, particularly individuals want to work for leaders who don't have that kind of guard of, um, you know, everything's okay all the time because it's just not possible. Yes, or, or the old one. I know when I started working, I got advice around, you know, never never show any personal elements of your life <laughs> and that's well, changed. Just checking at the door, <laughs> yeah. I think I was once told, like, when you take your key out of the car or when you press the lift button, whatever is going on for you at home stays there and you walk in and people are looking to you for your energy and you you know you must give off the energy that everything's fine because if people see that you're worried that we're and it's just these days it's completely unrealistic mainly because we lived in each other's yes. lounge rooms yeah. right and we saw the <laughs> children in the back over the over the shoulder and we understood that regardless of some people's roles they were working <laughs> closed in their bedrooms trying to hide from their kids so it's just not realistic for people now to not have that beautiful blend of life balance and it's no longer work from home sometimes it's you know you're, you're kind of taking your your work to the office and vice versa it's all very seamless so it's a new reality we all need to understand yeah so one of the questions I often get is people often say that you know recruiters approach them on LinkedIn or um, yeah or personally and approach them for roles at the same level that they're currently in so how do you attract the next level role? I suppose there's two elements to that. One is that are advertised or that aren't advertised. And um, yeah, so maybe just we'll touch on the first one. How do you attract that next level role? Yeah. And of course, if you think about recruitment in many cases as being about kind of risk mitigation for a client, um, looking to recruiters to find the very best person for the job can sometimes mean, you know, someone who's already doing that job somewhere else. And that's a, a very kind of predictable approach, I guess, when somebody, when a recruiter might be briefed a role. Let's just find the person who's doing this exact same role somewhere else. Right. They'll have, you know, strong evidence of success in that particular role, tick for the client, you know, sometimes tick for the individual. What we believe is that that is common where a recruiter is effectively just matching a CV or matching a LinkedIn profile online. What we hope for is um, to have built relationships with candidates to know their capability uh, enough that when we're talking to a client, we can talk with some evidence and some confidence that someone who is within our network that may not quite be at the level that they're looking for absolutely has the potential to step up into that particular role. Um, to do that, though, we need to have strong and trusting partnerships with our clients. They need to trust that we kind of know our staff and understand our communities. And we also need to have long-term and deep relationships with our candidates in our communities such that we can also vouch for that potential without needing to rely heavily on, you know, exactly matching years of experience and so forth. So that probably just speaks to why it's important as candidates to have strong relationships with recruiters, to have them follow your career so that they can, um, with some confidence, put you forward as a candidate who may be, you know, a high potential stepping up into a particular role because we know that having placed them elsewhere or having understood the kind of successes they've had over time, that they will rise to the occasion. So there's a little bit of it in that. In terms of the um, finding a role, a next level role that is not through a recruiter, that's when this power of networks and, and the hidden job market becomes particularly important because you generally need someone in the organisation to also see or vouch for the potential um, if it is that you don't kind of currently operate at that particular level. So what percentage of roles would you say are advertised in the hidden market or well, not advertised, I suppose? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, we don't have exact data, um, I must say, to measure that. So what we do know is that many roles do need to be advertised. And that's because, for example, in the government sector, there's kind of transparency and so forth that mean that, that roles uh, have to be advertised. There's also a lot of roles at the executive level that are confidential and that either may not be advertised at all or may be advertised in, you know, quite an ambiguous way, which is a little right. bit less common. Yep. We would say generally, though, in today's world, understanding the kind of labour market conditions and how few candidates are kind of relying 100% just on, on SEEK, that maybe just less than half of the roles that we work on or that we see are actually advertised in the traditional 
fashion. Uh, now, that's probably true of the past 12 months. It would have been higher than that uh, when there was just more job applications, when the market conditions looked a little bit different. But certainly the last, let's call it 12 or 18 months, the labour market has been so tight uh, that advertising to active candidates has not been a particularly fruitful exercise and there's been far more reliance on headhunting and other forms of search. So it's, that actually brings me to another question. A lot of people sort of say, you know, you should be in a role to apply for a role. Does it matter that you don't have a role? So you've left an organisation. Yeah. I mean, the main thing would be the articulation of why you're not currently working. Redundancy as a result of restructure is very commonplace these days. And so that's a very viable reason often as to why someone may not be working because it's no longer the case that redundancy means a kind of lazy way of exiting someone from an organisation. We see incredible people who um, have been, you know, kind of on the wrong side of a restructure mm -hmm. um, and that happens quite often. So, you know, being able to articulate the reasons why the role was made redundant, not the person, the role yeah. Yeah. Um, was made redundant is important. Look, if someone has been out of work for a long period of time, and I would say six months plus, then again, we would need to understand, is it genuinely because they've taken a career break for whatever reason? Is it because they're trying to transition into a different industry and that tends to take a little bit longer? It can be a bit more of a slow burn to pick up that role. So the main thing would be no, it's not necessarily the case that when someone's not working, we automatically assume that they are lesser in terms of their potential. But yes, it is something that we would inquire about, you know, and, and expect a very genuine and transparent response. And it might also be, you know, the reference checking in relation to, you know, the kind of honesty or authenticity behind that response becomes more important. Yeah, thank you. That's really helpful. So at the moment, it feels like when I speak to people that there's heaps of interviews, you know, <laughs> some yeah, people are going through yeah. seven or eight or, oh, amazing. So I suppose, can you walk us through the typical sort of executive interview process, if there is one, um, for a senior executive role? You know, how many interviews are the norm and what sort of process is, does it, do you go through? Yeah, I wish there was typical. It would make our life a whole lot easier. Um, and actually, it's interesting because, the again, there's the kind of dynamics of the talent market over the past 12 to 18 months, we have seen in many cases that the, the process has been reduced, particularly where it's a role in, in like a high demand discipline or where there's a, a real talent shortage, organisations have moved quite quickly right. and perhaps skipped various stages of what a typical process might look like. In response to your question as best I can, though, you know, the interview process is a bit like a funnel generally, and you would always expect that that first interview, I guess, is, I mean, organisations do it two different ways. It can be a slightly more casual kind of interview to get an initial sense of the alignment of personality trait and of values and a bit of a general overview of somebody's background. And if there's a tick to that first stage, then typically what would follow is a more technical interview or behavioural based interview to get kind of really underneath the surface of what you initially deemed to be a high potential candidate. There can be two of those as an individual in an organisation, a hiring manager kind of wishes to seek out support from varying kind of stakeholders in the business. So we would say by this stage that there might have been, you know, two or three interviews before you get to perhaps a coffee catch up with a CEO, testing and so forth. There's been, so I would say typically three to four interviews, sometimes more than that. And sometimes, as I mentioned, particularly in, um, in perhaps smaller businesses where there's less stakeholders to meet, it might be a founder that can be, you know, obviously a, a reason why there's not quite so many stages. Yeah. One of the other trends we're finding, though, is it's a little bit more of a casualization of the overall process. So more coffee catch-ups, more kind of, you know, meet and greets through the process. And I think that's also a product of the fact that you can have a quick half hour Zoom with somebody, which is less, less of an ask for them to get suited and booted yes. and make another trip in and take more time off work. So it really does depend. We very much um, are in the hands of clients in terms of how they wish to manage a process, but can consult where we feel like yes. the process is too long and a candidate is either going to 
disengage or expose themselves to the risk of finding another job in the meantime. So it is a little bit dependent on, you know, exactly how in demand an individual is. We can get people to hurry up if we think they're going to. Yes, I'm sure people, candidates would love to hear that. Okay, so strong leaderships are a requirement for executives. We did touch on this before, but it seems to evolve continually. Yep. And I suppose we actually did talk about this a little bit more, but you mentioned agility and um, change. Yep. Are there any other ways that you can sort of effectively demonstrate? I know you talked about storytelling. Is there anything yep. sort of that they should be really touching on in that storytelling? Yeah, I mean, they're very traditional kind of ways of answering behavioural based interviews. There is a little bit of an art to that. So I think for anyone listening today, getting game ready um, to, to be able to really perform in an interview, regardless of how seen you are, regardless of how many jobs you have, is a really important way to prepare to make a transition. And things like the STAR, um, you know, method in terms of how to respond, really important, you know, outlining a situation, well, you know, what was the kind of task at hand, what action did you take and what was the outcome, having really great examples that would speak to, let's say, the five or six key leadership behaviours that we think are important. Good example there is, um, you know, let's let's call it change agility, if it is that you're wishing to to express um, your capability in that respect, give a nice, big, compelling example, not a small thing. Right. So if it's a digital transformation strategy, what was your particular role in it? What was the kind of um, the action that you took personally to be able to, you know, to drive value through that particular process? Mm -hmm. And very importantly, uh, you know, what did you, what were the lessons that you learned? What went well? What didn't? um, And what were the outcomes, very specific outcomes that you can talk to, to bring that to life and you should be able to do that when it comes to things like trust explaining how you may have built trust with someone and you kind of go down the inventory of (laughs) leadership capability and and it's really just preparation what's the best example that I can talk through what is the evidence that I can bring to life and am I able to talk with confidence around the kind of outcome or impact I created as a result of that but it is definitely all about preparation yes (laughs) And everybody should do it. No one should walk into an interview thinking, I'll just wing it. Yes. And I think that some, um, sometimes people will say, oh, you know, I'm really worried about waffling. You know, I go on for too long. And the great thing about that formula is that at least you can keep your story tight, isn't it? Well, yeah, you don't want to kind of, and um, you know, ramble your way through a narrative that chews up too much of the interview. Um, you do, again, need to, you know, be quite disciplined and be able to answer second and third questions if they're asked. Mm. It's, you know, not just like, well, great, I gave my example <laughs> and, you know, I've got nothing else. So, yeah, and that's why they have to be genuine and authentic stories, not small things, because you need to be able to talk about them in a more complex or in-depth manner if required. Yeah. And one of the trickiest things that people find hard around interview process or the whole process is salary, the salary discussion, um, yes. especially when they want to increase their salary. So can who does? Yeah, it? of course. Can you give us some advice on how best to approach this discussion? Yeah, and it's probably become even more complex, Sarah, because of the fact that people are now more willing, you know, to kind of think about a transition to a different industry to a different role. It's no longer this kind of climbing the corporate ladder that means that every job might mean, you know, an extra 10% in salary. Often that means it's quite complex or ambiguous in terms of your views on the kind of salary that you expect. I would say my tips are number one, be really honest and transparent about what your current salary is and be, you know, absolutely expect to talk about that in the first conversation you have with a recruiter. It's one of the most important questions we ask and it's quite amazing uh, how often people are not willing to share their current salary firstly, which makes it difficult for us um, to get our head around exactly perhaps the level that they're at and to represent them well, that they don't know the makeup of their salary coming into that conversation. Uh, And that's specific to what is my base? What are my bonuses? It's quite amazing often that people are not 100% sure about those things. Absolutely, you need to (laughs) to make sure you know the details of those schemes. Um, and what, what is worse is where we get a genuine sense that somebody may be telling a bit of a tall tale 
understanding that we recruit very deeply in certain disciplines. We know organisations very well, um, so we can pick it relatively easily when someone's perhaps not being completely truthful about their salary, particularly then when it relates to asking second and third questions around the makeup. Yes, and yes. Sudden, um, so I think be really honest and transparent about where you're currently at, uh-huh. number one. In terms of answering the all important question of what are you looking for salary wise, you need to have done your research, first of all. So if it is that you're talking to someone about a role in a new industry or a different role in the same industry, it is important to have done some research in terms of the kind of salary bands that may be relevant at that level. If you don't know, asking a recruiter to support you with um, what is a realistic expectation and partnering with them in that manner is a good way to go. But there's plenty of salary surveys. There's plenty of people usually within your networks that you could get a sense of, well, what is realistic for me given what I'm looking for? So do your research. Um, If it is that you're looking for a sizable salary increase, you have to be able to provide a pretty rational you know, kind of um, story as to what, it, why is it exactly that you think a 20 or 30% salary increase is something that's realistic. And there's some good reason why often people are looking for that. They may be paid well under the band in their existing organisation for a number of reasons, or they may be in a um, particular discipline. Software developer is a great yep. <laughs> example off the top of my head that just, you know, based on current market conditions, um, you know, salary inflation in some disciplines in the past 12 months has been quite significant. And often those big salary increases come from changing jobs rather than from where people might have been in a business for five or six years and it's probably not as likely yes. they're going to get to the level they think they can from a market value perspective. So there's lots of different factors, but the main thing would be, yeah, be transparent, do your research and really be able to talk, you know, practically or with some logic as to what your expectation is and why. That's fantastic advice. Thank you. So you mentioned a few times uh, during this um, session that about having a relationship with recruiters. Yes. Can you tell us, you know, what's the best way to engage and work with a recruiter? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like anything, um, recruiters, um, people, <laughs> and whether it's a doctor, yeah. amazing. We're not all, we're not bots just yet. Albeit that, you know, I'm sure there's lots of people in the industry that believe that might be the case one day. But it's like a, a doctor or a massage therapist or a personal trainer. Like you really do have to uh, find, you know, a person even more so than a brand, but find a person that you gel with, that you, you know, that you're, um, you can build a, a partnership with easily. You can communicate easily and there's a sense of kind of trust and partnership off the bat. Now, it might take some time for people to find that person or those people. There might be two or three different recruiters that you have you're kind of in your corner over the course of your career. And there might be others that you come in contact with once. They might call you about a role. You might have a quick conversation. You may not be interested in that role and, you know, you'll never speak to that particular person again. For me, um, understanding now the power of partnership between a recruiter and a great candidate to the evidence of sometimes us having placed an individual three or four times over their career. It is important to seek out the recruiters that you think are doing the most interesting work in the space that you either are currently in or that you want to be in and really invest in um, a partnership if you can. Now, some people will say, well, they never call me back or, you know, I have had a terrible experience with a recruiter because they didn't service me or respect me in the right way. That's a pretty good sign that maybe they may not be that right person for you. Yeah, but when you do either take a call from a recruiter, even if you're not interested in a particular job, it is an opportunity, though, to build somewhat, like build some social um, capital with that person or be really generous in terms of giving them information about your career and what you might be looking for, even if it's that you're not active at that particular moment. And I wouldn't say, you know, rely always on recruiters keeping in contact with you between that conversation and when you're ready to move. Um, uh, There's lots of ways that you can keep connected with recruiters. Follow them on LinkedIn, comment on their posts, ask them for their advice, um, often around things like, you know, a salary review that you might be going into, uh, what the job market's currently doing. And once you do find someone that you can build 
connection with, I would say, you know, think about a long-term relationship with that person, even if it is that in that moment you don't think you need them. Yes. It is important to be front of mind and to have some kind of deeper connection with consultants who are really deeply working in a particular industry because when that job comes up, that often a client's kind of talking through, um, sometimes in the moment, you know, the light bulb goes yep. off and it might be a conversation you had with a great candidate two months ago where they said, oh, maybe this year might be the year I think about moving. They're the very first calls that we put in when we get back to the office rather than searching through a database of people that we don't mm-hmm. know. Fantastic. So invest and think long term. But if someone doesn't service you well, you don't think they've got your back, find someone who does. There's definitely going to be some great consultants in market that you can build longer term relationships with. Fantastic. Well, it's been a pleasure having a chat to you today, Susie. Um, And there's just lots and lots of gold in this conversation. And I know people will really appreciate everything that you've shared. Uh, Is there any final messages you've got for our audience today? Um, well, I think the, the main thing would be just be always on when it comes to managing your career. It used to be you're either active, looking for a job, or you're passive, don't want to know about it. Um, the world has changed thanks to the likes of you know LinkedIn and really building a personal profile, keeping your ears and eyes and peripheral vision open to opportunities and being game ready if one of those opportunities presents even at a you know inopportune time is really important so if you haven't got a linkedin page if you're not thinking at all about you know your career or where your you know where your career might go next i would say even the most basic things of updating your cv building a profile and thinking about who are great recruitment partners for me and how can i keep in contact with them Uh, perhaps things that everyone could be doing in 2023. Yes, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. And um, our listeners can find you on LinkedIn, is that right? And Absolutely. Well, your problem is they (laughs) can also follow the Six Degrees page. We have a huge number of blogs um, that can talk to any number of topics we've discussed today, how to negotiate a salary increase, best way to get game ready, how to manage an interview uh, really well. So, yeah, jump on our website and um, there's lots of great kind of templates and tools and tips that um, that anyone can find there to help get game ready in 2023. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Susie. Lovely to chat. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you.